Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. She didn't realize that cross was her pastor. <laughs> uh, let me give those to you. I'm going to call out some names. I want to uh, recognize some of these that have done a fantastic job, and we'll give, we'll give all of them a, a hand of appreciation afterwards. But uh, uh, as I call your name, I'm going to ask you to please come down here, and uh, we have a gift we want to give to you. Uh, we do have for our uh, preschool to kindergarten, Sister Weta Balance, and uh, her assistant, uh, Kaylin Blacklock. If y'all come down here, we uh, want to recognize our primary teachers. This is first through third grade, uh, Brenda Anderson and her assistant, Shauna Kellum. Y'all come on down. Uh, our preteen class, this is fourth through sixth grade, Phyllis Edwards and uh, Diana Riley. Uh, is Diana in the house? She's still on vacation. Whew. Some people just like to vacate. Goodness. Uh, our youth, uh, youth Sunday school, this is seventh through twelfth grade, uh, Justin and Courtney Plummer. We'll ask them to come up. College age. I, I still can't get over this. We are in the middle of nowhere. We really are, and we have a thriving college ministry in Poet. That's fantastic. Uh, our college-age teacher is Andrea Gismond. Come on down, Andrea. Uh, our young adult teacher, uh, Miss Weta Newton. Come on down, and her assistant, Brother Mark Ohms. I told them not to give you anything, Mark, but they, they insisted. Uh, our senior adults, Miss Pat Edwards and her assistant, Dana Teal. Want them to come down. We do have some additional uh, uh, classes that we teach for adult education. One of them is, uh, really, if uh, this is for any age, anybody that wants to become a member goes through uh, a, a class called, well, actually, if you're a new convert, a new, you're a new in Christ, living out this life, we have a, a class called Starting Point. Brother Mark Ohms uh, is the teacher for that. We already honored him once, so we're not giving you another gift, Brother Mark. Sorry about that. Uh, and then we have one called The Bridge. If you want to become a member uh, of our church, we have a class called The Bridge. And uh, our associate pastor, Brother Ed Plummer, is a teacher for that. Come on down, Brother Ed. And then we have one, and I love how God is doing this. Uh, uh, this is kind of dovetails uh, because we want everybody that comes to Christ uh, new to our church, we want them to go through all three steps of starting point and then the bridge class and then Bible 101. I'm going to ask Miss Vicki Goodman, come on down. She's the last of our triumvirate for a, a part of our adult education uh, classes. And, uh, and I want to say uh, uh, also we have one that was not on the list and uh, uh, she helps out so much. Uh, uh, Miss Taylor Edwards, come down here. She's, she's a lot of the, uh, uh, boy, if we, need, if we need a substitute teacher, she steps in there. If we need uh, somebody passing out the books and everything, she's right there with us. Somebody else that this used to be their cross to bear, and now they just, uh, they just love helping out, Brother Dean Balance. Uh, where's, where's Brother Dean at? I think he's out. I think he's outside making sure everybody behaves out there. Do you have, do you have anybody? You, is it? Oh, Shirley, and Shirley's not here. Shirley uh, teaches one of our classes. There's Dean. Brother Dean, come on down here. We want to give you a little something. And uh, we just want to say thank you, Lord, for great teachers like this that help us with Christian education. Let's give them a hand of appreciation. All right, guys, y'all can go have a seat. Thank y'all so much. Uh, Miss Phyllis Edwards is going to come say a word right now. I'm kidding. <laughs> she said, if you ask me to come say something, I'm going to throw up all over the carpet. But you do. Uh, janitorial. Oh, you okay? All right. All right, come on up here. Come on up here. That's Dana's fault. That's Dana's fault, yes. Let me get you a microphone over here. All right. 
Okay, she won't speak, <laughs> but I never have a problem talking. So I want to encourage you with why Sunday school? Why do we have Sunday school? First, I want to address it from the aspect of kids. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 22 and 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. If you are a product of Sunday school as a child, wave. Look at the hands. Look at the hands. Now, here's what the benefits were. If you bring your children to Sunday school, there is age-appropriate teaching for your child. The literature is designed for a two-year-old. It's designed for a five-year-old. Those fun little crafts that the kids bring out, they reinforce the lesson. They teach them the Word through the crafts and the activities they do in that Word. Your kids can build relationships in Sunday school, and we are all about relationships in this church. That's what we, we want our relationship with the Father first, but we want a relationship with one another. Your kids, by coming to Sunday school, they can get a, a relationship with God established at an early age. And I could not find this statistic, but the last time, which was several years ago, that I went to Sunday school training, they said that 84% of kids that came to Sunday school from age 3 to 5 stayed in, a ch in the church as adults. That's high-powered stuff. Sunday school can be fun. <clears throat> we have fun in Sunday school. Kids can have fun in Sunday school. They share with one another. They build those relationships. They learn and are trained systematically. There's a pattern to the way the lessons are outlined. From the very littlest to the biggest, they learn to pray. Now, granted, it's your responsibility as a parent to do it at home first. It was mine. It's still my responsibility to train my child. But why not have some help when it's right there available? It's right here for you. And um, think about, school's about to start back. Think about how much time your child stays in school in one week. It's over 35 hours. Think about how many hours that child stays at ball practice, gymnastics, Think about music lessons. Think about whatever it is, extracurricular, that your kid goes to after school. That's a lot of hours. If you figure up Sunday school, we don't even get 52 hours of Sunday school in a year. But let me tell you what, those 52 hours are very important. Get your kids here. And then Sunday school teaches your kids the right message. The world is out there offering everything to tickle their ears and give them anything they want for pleasure. Sunday school is going to teach them the truth. Now, I'm going to get off the kid level because we still have Sunday school for adults. And some Sundays we have a room full and sometimes we have three or four. So, and I know we've gone through summer, but now school's starting back. So, here we go on this one. Uh, I, I wish I could claim this part but I found this, and it's too good not to share. In Hebrews 10, it says, Let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works, not staying away from our meetings as some habitually do, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day up here approaching. The end is near. Why not as adults? I, I promise you it is a struggle some days at home to study that Bible on my own. But if I come together on Sunday morning with my friends, they're going to encourage me. And they're going to, my teacher's going to teach me. She's going to get me in that word. She may give you a handout that you can go home and study on. She may tell you next Sunday we're going to this chapter. Put yourself in the word and learn it. If you want to learn knowledge, the Bible says in John 21, 15, when they had eaten bread, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. How are you going to feed the sheep if you don't know the word? Amen. Sunday school is training. It, the, yeah. What I can read and study at home, and I come here to Sunday school, and Pat teaches a lesson, and I'm like, I never saw that. I never got that. It makes me grow. It makes me think. It's just like when Pastor Mike's up here and he says, get you some chocolate and a, a cup of coffee and ruminate on that. He tells us that all the time. How, how often do you write that down and go home and do it? In Sunday school, at least. I can't get in here in church. Brother Mike, I got a, I got a question. You do that in Sunday school. 
come and ask questions. If you come to church, and I've heard people say this, and they say, well, I just don't fit in down there. I just don't belong, blah, 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 blah. Well, maybe you need to plug into Sunday school because that's where you can belong. The Bible says rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, be persistent in prayer, share with the saints in their needs, and pursue hospitality. Part of church is hospitality, reaching out to run one another, meeting the needs of the people with us. It is a place of prayer in Sunday school. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and confess and pray for one another so they may be healed. And the intense prayer of the righteous is powerful. And also, it's a place of service. Now, listen, when I get in Sunday school on Sunday morning, I can come in here and one of the first things we do is take prayer requests. If I've got a need, I can share it. That should be a safe zone for me to express my concerns. It should be a place where I can celebrate the joys that God has blessed me with through the week. And hearing those things, if I hear somebody's prayer request, I can jot that down on the notepad. And I can go home and pray about that. I know better other than just having, well, so-and-so needs prayer. In Sunday school, you express what that need is. And you better know how to address the Father with that need. And also, when somebody's got a praise report, man, we don't have testimony service every week. But you can testify in Sunday school. You can tell what the Lord did for you during the week. Come to Sunday school. And the last, like I said, was a place of service. It says, do nothing out of a rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also the interest of others. We're told to share our faith. We are told that we shouldn't be high and mighty. Lord, help me. You know, keep us humble. But when we come in here and we get our, our tank filled up for the week, guess what? We can go out that door and we, the missionaries are out there. We don't need a missionary in here for the most part. A lot of you are already saved. And we have people, thank God, that are getting saved all the time. But when you leave that door, it's our job to take the things we learned in Sunday school and in church from Brother Mike and Brother Ed and whoever else preaches and take them out to a lost and dying world because the day is coming. We are at the end. So next Sunday, let's fill up Sunday school. Amen. I appreciate all those that are part of Christian education because Jesus was about Christian education. Christian education isn't necessarily Sunday school. It's about learning more about the Word of God and growing closer uh, to the Lord through that time of study. As you're turning with me in your Bibles to uh, Psalms 119, I want to say a, a great big welcome back, Brother Drew McCoy. He, you've been, done being at basic training. And uh, brother, thank you for your service to our nation. And uh, I appreciate that. Uh, 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 your grandma wondered if you'd ever turn out to be anything good for society. And I told her, yes, you would. I told her, yes, you would. <laughs> no, she did say that. But I'm proud of you, buddy. I am so proud of you. And uh, we, have some, we have some friends with us. We used to be their pastors years and years ago in Pottsville, uh, Arkansas. Good to have you guys. I didn't get to shake your hand and hug your neck, and don't, so don't leave before I get to. It's so good to see y'all. I'm glad you're still with him. He's worth putting up with. Hallelujah. Yeah. I get <laughs> And uh, we got some friends that we used to pastor in, uh, in Texas, and they're back with us, coming back from the National Fine Arts Festival in Kentucky. So I want to say God bless you guys for being, being with us today. Today, we are celebrating Christian education in our local church. Back to school time is, uh, you know, it's right around the corner. It's, it's about to start. And all the parents said, Amen. yes, thank you, Jesus. And uh, there's one or two kids that are excited. The rest of them are not so excited. But uh, um, I do want to say uh, thank you, Lord, for, for having a great school system like we have here in Poen. And do want to encourage all of you that can at 3 o'clock. We're going to be at the school praying, so come and join us. And uh, 
there's, there's something I want to share, some, some interesting thoughts with you. I'm, uh, and we're going to get to the reason for this, but I, I just wanted to share a, a couple things with you uh, uh, to kind of stir the pot this morning. This comes from the New York Times uh, back in August of 2010. This quote says, members of the clergy, talking about pastors, now suffer with obesity, hypertension, and depression at rates higher than most Americans and occupations. In the last decade, their use uh, among pastors of antidepressants has risen while their life expectancy has fallen. Many would change jobs if they could. Hallelujah. How many of you inspired by that quote? No, not very much. Uh, uh, there's... there's um, they go on to share some statistics that talk about uh, 1,500 pastors leave the ministry every month due to moral failure, spiritual burnout, or contention in their churches. 4,000 new churches uh, begin every year, but over 7,000 close their doors every year. 50% of pastors' marriages will end in divorce. Uh, 80% of pastors, 84% of their spouses feel unqualified and discouraged in their role as pastors. 50% of pastors are so discouraged that they would leave the ministry if they could, uh, uh, but have no other way of making a living. Uh, and it just go, goes on and on and on and on from there. And uh, boy, pastor, that, that's a, a real way to uh, encourage us. While these things aren't very encouraging or uplifting, hear me, because I'm going to do what I normally do. I'm going to swing a wide loop and then tighten it all back together. I want to demonstrate to you how a lack of Sunday school participation over the years has presented this quagmire of pastoral fallout that we have. That's, that's something that's uh, uh, documented and it's true. Now, the uh, uh, I think I got... Ah, oh, I love you, Dan. This works. The uh, uh, Sunday school, or what was actually known as Sabbath school. Sabbath school started years ago in England as a way of reaching out the poor and the uneducated children in England uh, in the 18th century. guy by the name of Robert Rakes uh, and some others devised a plan to gather poor children, uh, uneducated children that were working uh, into educational classes on Sunday because Sunday was their only day off. At this time, during Robert Rakes' days, uh, Parliament passed a new law that said children cannot work more than 12 hours a day. Consider that. And uh, so you had a lot of kids that were not in school because they were busy working, trying to help mom and daddy make a living. Clean clothes and learning materials were provided to the kids and it provided reading, writing, hygiene, and good citizenship for these children. That was the whole plan of it. And uh, hoping to make, this is what the church has thought, we might be able to make a better society as well as curb juvenile delinquency, which was on the rise. And uh, while evangelism was not necessarily uh, what was set out to be done or religious training, however, because they taught Scripture, they used Bibles, and they're in a Bible setting, they hoped maybe this would rub off on the kids while they're learning how to be good. Maybe they can be good for God. And so this is how what was known originally as Sabbath schools became known as Sunday schools. In America, the first national uh, Sunday school effort began around 1824. And this was their thoughts. We want to organize, evangelize, and civilize. That was their whole thought behind Sunday school. And the focus was intentionally evangelical. Bring a friend to church. Bring somebody to church. And it was amazing because... Uh, while people may not feel comfortable to come into a setting like this, they're willing to go into a room where maybe there was some coffee, maybe there was some refreshments back in the day because back in that time, when you came to church, it was like an all-day affair. And this was originally, because people at the bandwagon right now for my generation as pastors is small groups. We want small group settings. We want small group education. Sunday school was the original small group movement. And people felt, uh, they felt comfortable coming to Sunday school where coming to a setting like this, maybe not so much. But you know, where it's a little intimate group, that was fine. And Sunday school became, for a hundred years, uh, Sunday school was literally the evangelistic arm 
of the church. You didn't necessarily have people doing a lot of door knocking going around, but Sunday school was something people could say, hey, you know what, why don't you come to Sunday school with me? And it began to expand and bring in more than just children. Suddenly adults were coming because they were enjoying it. Who knew you could enjoy church? Come on, somebody. Now, I believe that as, as a pastor, I want to be a part of a church that knows how to worship hard. They know how to work hard. But when it comes time to play, mm, I want us to be able to play hard. I want us to have a good time, and I want people to remember you can have a good time at church. So Sunday school became a way for unbelievers to get introduced into a church and kind of assimilated into the church family. They got to know one another. I remember back in my childhood days, right after the Civil War, that when I was going to a Methodist church I was growing up at, uh, me and my parents, we, we, they would drive up. Uh, I mean, Sunday school was something you just went to. And so we'd show up at Sunday school, and I remember people. And this, see if some of y'all remember this. You'd come to Sunday school, and people would come to Sunday school, and as soon as Sunday school was over, you had people get in their cars and go home. They didn't stay for the service. Why? Because Sunday school met a cultural need in their life. I have community. I have friendship. I have fun. And the original thought is Sunday school is fun. Teachers, let me encourage you. Keep your class fun. For the children, for the adults, you can learn about God and enjoy learning about God. And see, the people came and they, they enjoyed. And that's why you have like even the Southern Baptists today, when you go to them, they ask, how, how big is your church? They'll say, well, we have 100 in Sunday school. We have 60 in Sunday. You ask them how big they are, they don't tell you what they run on a Sunday morning. They tell you how many they have in Sunday school because it goes back to this. Sunday school was a powerful thing. And this continued on until about the middle of the 20th century. Now, Sunday school attendance began a slow decline in the last 50 years or so. And as Sunday school declined, let me throw something out here for you. Church attendance began to decline. As people began to quit coming to Sunday school, they also quit coming to church. One factor generally agreed to for the reason of this was a shifting away from evangelism. People didn't want to evangelize anymore. They wouldn't want to talk to people about God. They didn't want to be confrontational. You know what? We're just going to stay in our four walls and do some discipleship and have fellowship. I believe in a five-fold approach. If uh, on the back of your bulletins, I think on the back of your bulletin right now, it gives our mission statement. We're going to see that in just a second. But every other month, it's a, it's a different one. Next month, you'll see one, and it says, we believe in fulfilling our mission statement through five areas. And we use the acrostic of WIFES, W-I-F-E-S, worship, instruction, fellowship, evangelism, and service. These five things need to be in equal amounts throughout our church. We need to be a church that knows how to worship. Let me tell you something. I am grateful for an incredible worship team up here who do a fantastic job. We also have to be a people of instruction which means we have classes, we have Christian education, because it's not just about the preaching, it's also about learning about the Word of God, how to study the Word of God, like going through Bible 101, how to know who Christ is in different classes we have. And then we have fellowship, because well, we just like to fellowship. And I'm just saying, fellowship goes a whole lot better when you have food, hallelujah. You're gonna see that's actually scriptural in just a minute. But we have fellowship with one another because we need to like one another. I remember when I grew up in a town called Florence, Texas, and there was, uh, uh, I went from kindergarten through 12th grade there, but I went to, when we finally started going to a Pentecostal church, and my dad's business was in a whole nother town in Colleen, Fort Hood. And uh, uh, I remember my, my best friends, I went, I went from kindergarten through 12th grade over here with, with uh, 36 kids. Salute. That's how big my senior class was. 18 of us went from kindergarten through 12th grade together. I, went, I grew up with these kids. You know where my best friends were? They were in my youth group. My best friends were in my youth group. That's why I, I, I hung out with them. And I, and I didn't go to school with them. Y'all go to school with each other. So y'all may get tired of each other. I don't know. But I didn't, I didn't go to school with them. I enjoyed being around them. They were my best friends. That was my community. 
And that, that literally changed my life by being with, with people who were like me. And uh, uh, as, as the, the fellowship part happens, you also have the evangelism because people got to know that Jesus Christ loves them. Who's going to tell somebody that Jesus Christ loves them if you don't? And then we have service, the last one, S, service, which simply means we reach out to those that are around us. We do service right here in our community. Our Easter egg outreach is service. Our backpack ministry is service. Even the concert that we have tonight, which, by the way, we need some folks to help us clear off the stage as soon as this thing's over with. We, uh, uh, our, even the concerts is a service to our area because we want to be a church that meets the needs of our community. And uh, what you find is people got away from that stuff and began to internalize inside their church. And uh, studies indicate that Sunday schools where a church, and I want you to think about this. If this has been your church for years, or if, this were, if you grew up in a church where, where, I mean, it was just happening and going, and I want you to consider this, that when a church is really blowing on all cylinders, everything's going and happening, it's an incredible church. Look at Sunday school, and you're going to find Sunday school was strong, it was going, it was happening. But when you look at a church that's dying on the vine, you're going to find out that Sunday school has depleted along with the attendance. There's a correlation there. The idea of Sunday school as a primary uh, evangelism tool is, is probably new to us, but I want you to consider this. Is it possible that a return to that model of Christian education, which I'm telling you, 930, man, that's a lot sooner than most of y'all go to work. Or a lot later. I mean, you get to sleep in on Sunday. Uh, uh, and these teenagers, y'all got to get back in the mode of getting ready to go to school, staying up till like 3 in the morning. Uh, that's going to, that dog will not hunt no more. Y'all got to go to bed. The, uh, I'm talking to my own kids. <laughs> yeah, y'all talk to yours. The, uh, uh, but you have, you have this place where if, if churches are falling apart, what would happen if maybe people got back to the Word of God? And I'm not just talking Sunday morning church. I'm talking Sunday morning at Sunday school, even Wednesday night because we have Christian education taken to Sunday night. Could it help revitalize our churches? Has Sunday school attendance declined in our church? And if so, uh, how can we turn it around? If not, why is it thriving? I want you to consider this. Now, I gave you all those statistics talking about pastors falling apart and, and going through hard times. Here's the reason for that. Pastors are called by God to train up people to, to do the work of evangelism. We teach you how to be evangelistic, how to tell people about Jesus. We teach you the need for discipleship to come in and learn from the Word of God. Because I'm telling you, you're not going to get the Word of God out there in the world. You're going to have to come someplace where the Word of God is to be taught how to study this Word. Now, that's our job. And if nobody else is doing it, if nobody else is doing the training, if nobody else is doing the work, guess who's going to be doing it all? The pastor and his wife, even our children. If there's nobody else to do it, it's going to be us that has to do it. Uh, and, and, and the pastors feel overworked, underappreciated, and they begin to fall apart, and they want to quit. And let me tell you something. When pastors quit, churches die. Are you hearing me? This is something I see throughout our area. I thank God I'm in Poen, but not everybody's blessed to be the pastor of Poen. Matter of fact, there's only one. <laughs> That's it. But I, I, I hurt for other churches and other pastors because I see their hurt. I see their pain because they feel like they're trying to do it all by themselves. When our job as a pastor is to equip you to be the army of God, Ephesians chapter 4, that you are trained up to be the whole body of Jesus Christ. And when that's not happening, the church dies. So it isn't, isn't it interesting that Sunday school, when it began dying out, due largely to less commitment because you don't want to sacrifice time or effort for the kingdom of God, but rather for personal things. Consider this, is that as Sunday school began dying out, the church began to weaken. Attendance began to go down. Morale began to go down. Pastors fell all alone and began to quit and next thing you know, we live in a society where divorce is on the rise, abuse is on the rise, addictions are on the rise, crime is on the rise. All you got to do is look on the news and realize the world's getting worldlier, not godlier. And my question is, is where's the church? 
Well, I can tell you where the church is. It's not in church. The church has gotten smaller instead of greater. Psalms 119, starting in verse 9, says this. How can a young man cleanse his way? Now, this isn't just for young men. It's for older, older men. It's for women. It's for all of us. How can a person keep their way clean? By taking heed according to your what? Your word. Your word. This right here tells us how we can live pleasing to God. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wonder from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not what? Sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. And with my lips I declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. The amazing thing is this book right here will help you get over your sin problem. This word right here will get you over your addiction problem. This word right here will get you over your depression problem. This word right here will bring healing not only to your heart and mind, it'll help bring healing to your body. Which tells me if I'm going to live for God, I got to be a man of his word. That's what he said. Because his word Minister to every part of his person. All the things of who he was. God's word shapes us. It helps us. It, it heals us. It keeps us from falling. And when we do fall, it helps turn us back around. But if we aren't studying that word, it's not changing us. If we come to church, let me be a pastor just a second. If I had my glasses on, I'd take them off so I didn't have to look at your beautiful faces. I want to say something a little hard here. If all we do is come on Sunday morning, and that's the extent of our spiritual growth, we suffer. If all we are is coming on Sunday morning or whenever it can fit in our schedule, and that's it, we become religious without growth. We become followers with no faith. We might have the appearance of being big in Jesus, but all it takes is one puff of wind and we fall to pieces. I'm telling you, as we grow in our maturity in God, as we grow in this word, we gain the ability to stand strong. And when a church is not standing strong, when a people are not standing strong, it's because they may come, but they're not in. And I want, I want you to hear me. I'm not trying to have the biggest church in town. I'm not trying to be the, the most whatever connected church in our area. That means nothing to me. What I want is to see you grow strong in Jesus Christ. I want to be a house that has some of the strongest men and women of God in this area because you grow in Jesus Christ. That's my heart. I want to see you become all that you can be in Jesus Christ. And that means more than just coming to church once a week. Matthew 28 says this, Go therefore make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Even though Jesus was speaking to the disciples, there was more there than just the 12 disciples. There were people who are just like you. You love God. Does anybody love God in this house? Um, let me know I'm in the right place. All right, you love God. You were represented on that hill. Jesus told this stuff to you. What did he say? He said right here, he said, go and what? Make disciples. That's work and effort, friend. That means we got to go where people are. We got to be able to teach them because I'm telling you, they're not going to learn by osmosis. I can't carry this Bible around and suddenly I'm just gaining knowledge about Jesus Christ. I got to get in this thing and I got to be able to understand it. Sometimes I need somebody to help me understand this word. I know you think I'm just this genius scholar, and, and, and for the most part, I am. Hallelujah. But there are times I need somebody to show me I got no clue what that means. And I need somebody to teach me. Listen, we will only grow as much as we are hungry. 
Jesus is saying, you go out and make the disciples. I'm telling you, Sunday school teachers, that's what you're doing. Those of you that are in Christian education, that's what you're doing. You're making the disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. This is what we as a church are called to do. Not look pretty. Not look pretty. I, I, I have, let me make a confession here. I enjoy, I, as a pastor, I do need to bring in missionaries. And I do need to bring in people. You need to hear the word of God more than just me. I need you to hear people that come in and edify what I'm telling you as well. So it kind of works together. There's, a, there's a, a flow of thought there. But I really don't care anymore to hear missionaries or evangelists come in and say, man, what a beautiful building you have. Do you know what this is? This is a barn. All this is is a barn that's meant to get the job done. This is just a building. You are the church. I will tell you, you are a beautiful church. And if you have a mind to it, you are the most powerful church God could ever have. You have the ability inside of you. You have the Holy Spirit around you. You have a God who is leading you. You have a word that is educating you who can cause you to be the best people, the best church God has ever made in this world. It's up to you. It's up to you, teenager. It's up to you, mom and dad. It's up to you, grandma and grandpa, to be that kind of church. And Sunday school and Christian education is important for both you individually and it's important for us as a church. And the classes and the groups that we offer throughout the week on Sunday mornings, on Wednesday nights, are efforts to fulfill the Great Commission. That Great Commission is our mission statement, which is what? To know him and to make him known. Come on, say it with me. To know him and to make him known. Say it again. To know him and to make him known. That's why we exist. We are not here to fill a building. We are not here to have a building. We are not here to please the assemblies of God. I want to hear my God say, well done, good and faithful servant, because you've been faithful to do what I called you to do. What is that? That's to go out and bring in. To know God and make him known to those around me. Christian education is something that can be done over coffee. I think a lot of things about Jesus could be done over coffee. Hallelujah. Getting together with one another and just sharpening one another, just getting together. Man, I've had some beautiful times of friendship and relationship and growing in God, and it had nothing to do with being in church, but it had everything to do with being with God's people. We have one hampering thing, and that hampering thing is our motivation. We ask these questions. Now, come on. Somebody love me here today? I hope you wore your steel toe boots because if you didn't, I apologize. I'm stepping all over your corns and your ingrown toenails. But, okay. Love me now. Love me. We ask the questions. Why should I come? Why should I come? What's in it for me? It's boring and it's useless and I don't have time for that. Now, I have been guilty of being a boring teacher before. You better not say amen now. But I'm telling you, there was a day. I remember, I remember as a youth pastor, first time ever as a youth pastor, thank God somebody got in the Assemblies of God and changed the curriculum. But I mean, they gave, they gave some, I'm telling you, some of the worst stuff for Sunday school. Here I was in the middle of summer, summer break, and you know what they give me to teach teenagers? The end times, they want me to teach them the book of Revelation. There is nothing going to cause a teenager to stay home like the book of Revelations. I'm telling you right now, Revelations, Daniel, Habakkuk, all those guys, man, we were wading chin deep in that stuff. And I said, I, mm-mm, I can't do this. Them, I'm trying to explain deep the, uh, theology and high religion to these kids. And I mean, they're getting glassy eyed. I, I was having to feed them Dr. Pepper and Coke, you know, just to, just to stay awake with me now. Hallelujah. It doesn't have to be boring. I'll tell you that church is what you put into it. That's right. That's right. Man, I don't get nothing out of worship. I don't get anything out of worship. And then I turn around and look, and man, they all over this place. Man. 
uh, walking around, dancing around, getting with it, man. I see people getting their socks blessed off. Some of y'all didn't have any socks to begin with. So maybe the problem in that, maybe it's me. Well, the word doesn't do much for me. I get bored. Mm. But then people come to the altars responding to that word. Maybe it's not the word. Maybe it's me. And see, we have to be able to take that first critical look and say, maybe what's wrong isn't here. Maybe what's wrong is here. Do you love me? I'm telling you, before I start complaining about something, I got to look at myself first. I can complain all I want about my nation, but have I done anything to lift a finger to make America great? If I haven't, shame on me. That's all my political statements for today. Hallelujah. Let me read you something. I know time's getting away. I want to read you something here. There's a book I want you to get familiar with because we're going to be doing some study on it. It's called Autopsy of a Deceased Church, talking about churches that have died. Brother Tom Rayner, if you've ever been to a Lifeway Christian bookstore, Tom Rayner is the head of, uh, for the Southern Baptists, all those Christian bookstores. And he talks about omission from the Great Commission when we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. And he said, related to the great omission is the nature of conversations among church members of dying churches. These members, as we have noted earlier, often fixate on the good old days. Have you enjoyed good old days? Listen, I'm living right now my good old days. There's going to come, come a day when I'm not going to be here anymore. I'm going to be on the backside of the desert somewhere saying, man, I remember the day I was in Poen, Arkansas. Woo, glory. I remember days I was in Pottsville, Arkansas. We had some good times there. In, in Killeen, Texas, we had some good times there. I remember those golden days. And those days in their memories include some spectacular results. High attendance day that often marked the peak of the church. Dozens of new members every year. Vibrant ministries in the community. Recognition for their growth by the denomination or some similar body. And as the members of the dying church recalled those days, often decades later, they longed for the similar results today. They often wondered why they could not replicate those good old days like right now. And it was not unusual for them to blame others for their plot. You see, these members had a convenient omission in their recollection. They wanted the same results as yesteryear, but they weren't willing to expend the effort. Remember the action and words of Matthew 28. Go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. Members of the dying church weren't willing to go into the community to reach and to minister. They weren't willing to invite their unchurched friends and relatives. They weren't willing to expend the funds necessary for vibrant outreach. They just wanted it to happen without prayer, without sacrifice, without work. But here's the bigger issue. Even if the church began to grow on its own, the members of a dying church would only accept the growth if the new members were like them. And if the church could continue to do church the way they wanted it. The reality, ah, there's a couple of you shouting, come on, <laughs> hang in there with me. That reality, when it's all said and done, is likely at the heart of the issue. Members of a dying church really didn't want growth unless the growth met their preferences and allowed them to remain comfortable. Our lack of involvement in the discipleship effort, whether it's attending church, teaching a class, helping with a class, facilitating something, promoting an event, uh, our lack of involvement leads to a withered self, a dying church, and a backslid nation. Look at America today. Now look at the church. Now look at you. We can't say anything about America until we look at ourselves first. Jesus said in John 6, 30, 6, 63, he said, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. These words, friend, listen, these words right here, this isn't Mike Sullivan's word. This isn't the assemblies of God. Man, I ain't, there's no way we're creative enough for this. We can't make this up. This is God's word. Yeah. And according to Jesus, his words are life. Yeah. And if I want life, I got to be getting that word inside of me. 
In Acts chapter 2, there's a beautiful picture here. It says this, then Peter continued preaching for a long time. See, I got a good role model. Hallelujah. <laughs> Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believe what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. All the believers devoted themselves. Now, look at this. The believers, that's you, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in the midst. See, I'm telling you, church is good with food. Hallelujah. It's right there. And to what? Prayer. These are things that have got to be going on in our life. We stand today on the shoulders of an early church. We are here because of what they did then. He goes on and says, a deep sense of awe came over them, and the apostles performed uh, many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place, and they shared everything they had. And they sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those that were in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. I'm glad we don't have church seven days a week. I mean, you find it hard coming on Sunday and Wednesday. They did it seven days a week. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. What is that? That's the small groups. That's Christian education. That's getting together for the Word of God outside the house of God. They met together for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meal. Ooh, it's so good, he said it again. They shared meals with great joy and generosity, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those that were being saved. Listen to me, church. I really and truly believe this. This is not something I got to say because I'm the pastor. I'm telling you, something good happens when we're all a part of the process. And if you're not a part of the process, we're missing you. We're needing what you bring to the table. We're missing what you add to the body of God. We miss the conversation that you could be sharing with us if you're not with us. We as a body are weaker because the foot isn't here. The big toe isn't here. The pinky toes are missing. I'm telling you, if you don't know a hard life, try moving off those pinky toes and try walking. It's difficult. When we're missing a part of the body of God, we all suffer. So I'm telling you, we got a treasure, and that treasure is Christian education. We have got to get back to Christian education, educating ourselves in the Word of God. I'm telling you, friend, if, if, all, if all you do is grow in God by coming here on Sunday morning, you're missing something. There should be something you're doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday. That's getting in His Word and getting in His presence. If you don't know how to do that, come and see me. That's why we're here. We need you to grow in Jesus Christ. Amen. God needs you to grow in his son. Because if we're not doing it, who else will? Yes, Nobody's sending missionaries to Poe in Arkansas. We're it. So let's be the body of God. Yes. Bow your heads with me right now. The first thing I want to do is there may be some that are here right now. You do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And I'm telling you, there's no better place to find God than right here. There's no better moment. Is there any reason why you couldn't give your heart to Jesus Christ today? I'm telling you, people give their heart to Jesus here on a regular basis. We are a redeemed people, people who are brought back from our sins. We are a people who are imperfect. We're not overly holy. We are trying to be Jesus' men and women. But we know the joy of a relationship with Jesus Christ, and we want you to know it too. If you're here today, we're going to give you an invitation in just a second to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. I want my pastoral staff, would you come right now and stand across the front? I want you to be ready. Because I'm telling you, when you come, you're not going to be alone. There's going to be men and women that are here to help lead you into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Where's my altar workers? Would you come right now and just stand across the front? You're here today and you'd say, Pastor Mike, I don't have that right relationship. I never have, or maybe I did at one time, but I don't have it anymore. And I'm ready to have that relationship again. If you're here today, I'm telling you, 
This is not a time to be worried about what people think because we are telling you, welcome home. There's no thing we're going to rejoice about like people coming home today. So if you're here, you know it's you because your heart's hammering in your chest. You know it's time. I'm telling you, we're ready to love you into a right relationship with God. You're here today. and You're ready to give your heart to Jesus Christ. Would you step out from where you're at right now? We have men and women that are ready to pray with you. They're ready to pray with you and lead you into that right relationship. Come on. Are you here today? Don't wait. Don't wait. Come on. The Holy Spirit's nudging you. This is your time. This is your hour. Are you here today? You're ready to give your heart to the Lord. I don't want to miss a chance for somebody to find Jesus Christ as their Savior. you're out there seated the Lord's laying it on your heart why don't you look over to your neighbor and just ask them say do you want to accept Jesus as your Savior I'll go with you I'll go with you and I'll pray with you if you're here come on just ask your neighbor if they need to come down it's all right you don't have to come by yourself I guarantee you won't be by yourself we're going to celebrate you we're going to celebrate what Christ does in your life come on are you here today and you're ready to receive Jesus as your Savior Come on, step out right now. We want to pray with you. We want you to have that right relationship with God. Now, Father God, I'm going to pray right now and believe that everybody that's here today is right with you. And Lord, I pray this with all the love of my heart. If they're not right with you, Lord, I beg, do not let them die in their sins. But Father, I pray right now, hold on to them. And please, get hold of their heart. Get hold of their mind. In the midnight hour when nobody else is around, God, keep drawing their thoughts back to you. Thoughts back to you that, Father God, there is no peace until they find you. And when they find you, they will find the peace in their life. They will find that completeness they've been needing. Father God, get hold of their hearts right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And now, church, I'm going to ask you. The Lord is looking. I believe, as Sister Dana said, we are living in the last day's moment. We don't get much time for this. The Bible says we got to work while it's day because night is coming when no man can work. There's going to come a time when we're done. Either we're dead or Jesus has taken us home. We have this opportunity. We have one life. We have one opportunity to please God with how we live and what we do. Are we knowing him and are we making him known? Are we taking seriously the things that God is serious about? So I'm going to ask you to stand with me across this place and don't leave yet. Stand with me across this place. I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer right now. Lord God, help me to take you seriously. Come on, can you pray that right now? Lord, help me to take you seriously. Lord, help me to take your word seriously. Lord, help me to live this life right. Help me not to try to make you convenient. Help me not to try to get what I want out of you. But help me, Lord, to be the child of God you need me to be. Help me to live this life right. Help me to be dedicated to your ways, Lord. Help me so that I don't miss you. Father God, I know full well that there's going to be a time when we stand before you and all of our good intentions doesn't help us at all. All those coulda, woulda, shouldas are not going to help us at all. It's going to be, what did you do with my son? And did you make him known to those around you? Father God, I pray we have this one life, this one opportunity. Help us to take you seriously, Lord, to take your word seriously, Lord, to be committed because the world's not committed. And if we're not committed, we will not impact the world, but the world will impact us to our detriment. So, Father, help us to do this right. God, I pray that as we leave this place, help us to have a good day. Help us to have a wonderful afternoon. Father God, I pray that you would help us to be used of you 
Draw us, Lord God. If we need drawing, draw us. God, convict us where we're wrong. God, convict us where we need to make things right. Convict us, Lord God. It's never condemnation. It's not to make us feel bad. Your conviction always makes us feel better. So, Father God, I pray, do that today. God, walk with us. Bring us back tonight for a great time of service. The concert tonight, Lord God, is our service to our community. And Father God, we thank you for an opportunity to give. And we give you glory in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. 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 Turn to somebody, shake a hand, hug a neck because you love one another. Listen, two things real quick. If you're interested in our new foster care ministry, I'm telling you, this is one of the best ministries you can be a part of, of giving of yourself. Be sure and go to your conference room out here to the right in the hallway. Go to the conference room. Meet Amy Deal. She's going to talk to you about uh, foster ministry. We do need some men that will hang around. Help us very quickly to clear off the platform. Anybody that can be here at 2 o'clock to help us unload the tour bus, we do need some help to get their equipment set up. God bless you. We love you. Have a great afternoon.